We are, uh, um, I love when we have an odd uh, number of weeks in a sermon series because um, I enjoy being able to say we're right in the middle. <laughs> um, you blame it on me being the middle of three children or my favorite color being right in the middle of the rainbow. No, <laughs> like, but I, there's something about the middle that feels really good to me. And um, so we're right in the middle of a sermon series. This series talking about the fact that Every single gospel slows down the story of Christ significantly when we come to this week. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the donkey and it's this triumphal entry and it's, yes, Hosanna, right? Everything at that point slows down. And so we've intentionally turned that whole week into three weeks worth of sermons. Uh, And while it may feel a bit strange that this week we're not talking about the triumphal entry, if you missed that sermon, you can just go back, you know, just look it up on the podcast (laughs) or you can look it up on YouTube. It's there talking about Jesus coming in and that fact that they, they didn't really understand what Jesus was here to do. Uh, today, we're, this, this is actually um, it's a unique situation in that we're looking ahead to what we'll be experiencing during this week. The title of this sermon is called The Passover Lamb. Uh, it says, Luke 22, 7, that's just where we'll be starting. How about that? (laughs) Um, But we'll be actually going through a number of scriptures and then similar to last week, talking through the stories after. Um, I'm going to pray and uh, then we'll then we'll jump into it. Father, thank you uh, for your (laughs) presence, your joy, your peace with us, even this far, God, in this time of worship. Uh, We know that you are here, Holy Spirit, and we're grateful And so, Lord, as we even go into this time in Scripture, your word, be honored, be glorified, be worshiped, be adored in all of it. Truly, God, may this time be about you and about our hearts being united with where you are, God. May everything that I say bring you glory and build up this body of believers in your name. Amen. All right. So... I titled the sermon, The Passover Lamb, because a part of this week is Passover. The, Jesus wasn't just coming up to Jerusalem because he needed to go be at an Airbnb. Like, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem because it was Passover week. And Jews from all over the world were coming to Jerusalem as a part of the celebration of Passover. And for those of us who are not Jewish and those of us who perhaps don't always remember or connect all of the stories in Scripture, the Passover was an incredibly important time for Jews. And I want us to watch this video truly. This is a clip from the best movie to ever be made. Okay, all right, go ahead and play the video. (laughs) God has come to me again, saying, take a lamb, and with its blood, mark the lintel and posts of every door. For tonight, I shall pass through the land of Egypt and smite all the firstborn. But when I see the blood upon your door, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not enter.
Okay. So, no, I was a little excited, but that's been my favorite movie since 1998 when it came out. <laughs> Passover is the annual remembering of when God led the children of Israel out of bondage, but specifically, one of the last plague was that the first born in Egypt would die, which has cultural significance for them, that firstborn um, ultimately is the one who carries the family, right? They are the ones who carry not only the name and the business, but also the honor of the family too. So for God to specifically strike the firstborn was an important thing for all of them to understand and for all of them to feel the weight of that. And God instructed Moses, as we saw in the clip, to tell everyone who was in Israel, all the Israelites, to slaughter a lamb and use the blood of that lamb to put on the, over the door. When we talk about Jesus as a Passover lamb, that's what they're pointing to, right? It's important to connect those dots. That's important, like, this is an important time in the, like, calendar for more than just us as believers, as Christians. This is an important time in an annual calendar for even Jews because they still remember Passover, we have joined in that remembering and also have yet another reason to remember this Passover. And so Jesus has entered into Jerusalem. There's been this celebration. Jesus is entering to with his disciples, those following him, to the city to remember that God spared them in that plague with that Passover. And then we'll, and so now we jump in at Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, go prepare the Passover meal so we can eat together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. I'm only pausing just to kind of like, if you remember from last week when Jesus tells them, go get the cult and you'll see this, it'll be that. If anybody asks, tell them I said this. It's kind of this repeated theme. Jesus is telling them ahead of time what they will experience before they experience it as we get into this slow motion week. But that's not the only thing Jesus is telling them. Like, there's a whole lot of other things Jesus is saying. He's also saying things like, the Son of Man must die. <laughs> and all of the people are going to turn away from him. And they just, like, skip over that part. Jesus at this point is doing a whole lot of predicting. And I think one of the most exciting things about Luke and the way Luke tells it is Jesus gives all this incredible detail about what they're going to experience when they go prepare the coat, when they go prepare the meal, but also giving them all the information they're going to experience after he actually does what he's here to do.
Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. They don't even think about it. (laughs) For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then, pause, I got to stop us. Until its meaning is fulfilled, we're about to go into this first, like, communion-looking thing. But the whole a reason why I keep pointing to that Passover thing is because they're eating a Passover meal with the lamb. <laughs> right? So when Jesus says, I'm not going to eat this Passover meal again until its meaning, its meaning this meal that they're having with Jesus is what he's talking about. We're not going to even do this thing again until I have fulfilled what the Passover lamb actually is. What we're eating right now to remember was just a foreshadowing of actually what was supposed to happen. I'm the actual Passover lamb. They don't get it, right? They don't catch it. They're just like, yeah, Passover every year. Let's make sure that we have the collard greens just the way I like them. That's right. That's not what Jesus is on at this point. Jesus is predicting things, letting them know, hey, I know y'all are in the present, but I'm a couple of days ahead letting you know this Passover thing is shifting. He continues. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. I just need us to pause because they're sitting around. We don't have in our in like in our typical American culture, we don't really have a holiday that is is designed to make us remember something like this significance. So I need us for a moment to just pretend we're in first century Jerusalem. They're every single year remembering that bring them out of slave sons and spared lamb. That's What's happening emotionally, mentally. And so pull up whatever family story you have that brings back not just fond memories and smiles, but lets you know at the core of who you are, this is, this is who I am. The whole reason why, why we celebrate Passover is because of who we are as Jews. Easter should be like that for us. Amen. Easter should be like that for us. <laughs> And we'll talk about that next week. But for them, this has such significance. And Jesus at this point is saying, and I'm turning the dial a little bit. I'm turning the dial a little bit. Changing who you are a little bit. Because all of who you are has been in preparation for who I'm about to make you. When Jesus starts talking like that, this new covenant, this new agreement, things are changing. And you've related to Passover in a way that you will not after this night. But then a curious part comes. All of this beautiful intimacy with God. And then... Verse 21, but here at this table sitting among us is a friend, as a friend, is the man who will betray me. (laughs) For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. Nobody seems surprised about that. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? Can you imagine what that was like? So for a picture... 
you've been following Jesus around for now three years. You've seen him heal people and raise people from the dead. There have been blind people who were blind from birth who now have sight because of this man. He's walked on water. <laughs> He's calmed seas. And there was this booming heaven that was said, this is my baby boy and I'm proud of him. Like there's just wildness happening all over the place. It's intense. It's joyful. It's sometimes scary. And then and so at that point, they should all be trauma bonded to the, <laughs> at that point. Right. Like. You know, when you live through something with somebody that's like, that was traumatic, and they're like your best friend forever <laughs> at that point, because we lived through something. I feel like the first year of summer camp is that. <laughs> I have friends whom I have known since my first year at summer camp, and it's because that was a crazy year. <laughs> now that I said, there's a couple people who attend this church who I worked with at that camp. <laughs> now that I... <laughs> See, we're trauma bonded, y'all. <laughs> so, and so the idea that they're sitting around with people who they have shared such intimacy and hard moments and great moments with, one of them is going to betray Jesus. I need us to feel that. Because the very next verse, the disciples began to ask each other, which of them would ever do such a thing? Pause. I know I have. I, I, I know. Just don't read the next part yet. This is actually, the, in other, there's another gospel in John where Jesus said, the, the gospel of John, rather, where Jesus says, the one who's about to betray me, I'm going to put this bread in his mouth, which I, I have a hard time with. But I also, it's because, it, the reason why I have a hard time with it is because it just, just, it rips me apart to the idea that Jesus is aware, so incredibly aware of what's happening, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what's about to happen. And he is literally serving the one who's going to betray him. I could not do that. I'm not there yet. Holy Spirit, help me. I still have people blocked on Facebook who betrayed me. <laughs> and I'm working on it. But Jesus not only is sitting with comfortable, content, says, and one amongst us is about to actually betray me. It's got to happen, so let it happen. And they miss it. I said, like, the title of last week's sermon was They Just Didn't Get It. It actually continues. <laughs> because they began to ask each other, but then they quickly get off of it. Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tiana, read the room, people. Jesus has, like, if we're just tracking right along with what we've read so far, Jesus has, they, they've walked into Jerusalem, go prepare the Passover meal, gives them such incredibly detailed directions about what they should do and what they'll experience. He tells them, I'm completely redefining Passover for you all. Not only will it be that you remember that God delivered Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, but I am about to do something that is going to completely change the whole world. We have a covenant now that's going to be new and it's based upon the fact that I'm going to die you all aren't responding to that at all but I'm going to say it again it's I, it, this covenant is in the fact that I'm a sacrifice and one of you is about to betray me I wonder which one of us is the best Now, listen, they're humans, right? They're humans. This is a, this is a point in the story in which it, it becomes painfully obvious that, like, they're, they're, this, their humanness is just on full display. They don't get it. 
But the part, of why, the part of why it tears me apart is because of how, like I said last week, how much I don't also get it sometimes. And if you're honest with yourself, you know the story, right? You know Jesus dies. You know it's on Friday. You know that he rises on Sunday. We celebrate. It's a party every single time. Yes, it's great. But they didn't get what was about to happen, just like we don't always get what's about to happen. There are little deaths that happen in our life that we are completely overlooking when God is actually pointing to that thing right there or this part of you right here or this little thing. It's about to die and we are completely oblivious walking on thinking about life as it is let's just have this Passover meal hey can you pass me the turkey which one of us is the baddest and the coldest at this table I'm about to die I'm about to be a sacrifice so they're human so are we And I know we know how this story plays out. But before I judge them and before I judge Judas and before I judge everybody else in the city who didn't get it. It is frequent that I don't get when God's about to kill and resurrect something. When there's about to be another mini Passover. I don't always see it. And yet the merciful, gracious God that we see in Jesus says, I'm way up here. And y'all having conversations way down there. Yeah. <sighs> they don't get it that. Okay, well then just go be where they are. And Jesus told them, in this world, <laughs> the kings and great men lord it over their people. Yet they are called friends of the people, or friends yeah, of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. I just, I, that's just the last portion of Scripture we're going to read that continues. But there was just something about the mercy of Jesus in that moment for me that was like he could have scolded them. And he taught them, yes, but he could have scolded them like, I'm trying to have a serious, like, eternity-changing moment with you all, and you're sitting here arguing about who's the best. Nope, he just comes down to where they are and says, let me make sure I remind you of something. He actually continues that teaching by using himself as a reference, saying that he has come to serve. This image is just a little animated image of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And this is like, this was happening during that night. This is Thursday night in the story, right? This was, Jesus was washing their feet, really demonstrating that idea that literally the greatest in this room (laughs) serves. If you want, to have a, you want to have a definition of what greatness looks like for my kingdom, it looks like getting on your knees and washing your brothers and sisters' feet. Yes. That's what that looks like for us. All the while also telling them it also looks like becoming a lamb. The whole purpose of even this little thing, it's a, it's a little nuanced movement. Yes, Jesus is talking to them about servant leadership. Yes, Jesus is instructing them to be humble. Yes, but he's also pointing to the fact that the king of the universe, the God of all creation even serves in becoming a sacrifice. That's how we roll in the kingdom. So, the remainder of this portion of scripture before, or excuse me, uh, this story before it actually comes to um, the resurrection is a couple little movements. Because now you've seen the backdrop of Thursday night moving into Friday. So the next thing that you would see in scripture is Jesus telling Peter, hey, you're going to actually deny me three times. Because G- Peter comes to Jesus it's like, hey, I know you were in there talking about you dying and stuff, and, you know, Judas, he already, he already left. But I just want you to know, I got your back. 
okay? You and me, okay? We walked on water together. We're good. You're good. And Jesus is like, come here. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something right now. Before even morning, <laughs> before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. Like, before the sun gets up good. I'm like, nah, Jesus, I'm taking my sword with me, and I'm going to cut off somebody's ear. I'm like, right, he doesn't know he's going to cut somebody's ear off. But he's like, this is Peter, right? He's the one who does this. He's the one who's like, yeah, I was like, get off my boy Jesus. And Jesus like, listen, <laughs> I know you feel good about this right now. It could be the bread and the wine. But by the morning, <laughs> by the morning, you will have denied me three times. <laughs> and let's just be real. He's talking to Peter, but literally every one of them scatters, right? Jesus goes to pray, takes three of the disciples with him, and he's praying there with them, and they fall asleep. Like, this picture, you can't see all the details of it. It's pretty simple, but... Like, Jesus is sweating. Like, there's the, the, the portion of Scripture says that Jesus is sweating, and it's like blood falling from his head. Because Jesus is, at this point, this is where the humanness of Jesus is on full display. Right? We've just seen the deity, the God part of Jesus, and the fact that he can predict exactly where they're going to have dinner. And he's at this point forecasting everything they're going to experience over the next 72 hours. But at this point, Jesus is like, yeah, dad, that feels like that's going to be really, really painful. Is there any way else we can do this? He's, it's like a board meeting between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit happening. Is there any other way we can do this? No? Okay, let your will be done. Okay, let me, one more time. Is there any other way this could happen? No? All right. One? No? Okay. Right? That's, and they're off sleeping. And I know that, that we, you've, if you've been around church for a while, you've heard that story before. But I need us to see that as a part of the pattern of them abandoning Jesus. That's why the gospel writers would tell us that. Not just because they're tired. They've been tired before. They were hanging out with Jesus. And this, this being has no concept or care for time. Jesus doesn't care about time. He's like, y'all staying up with me. We're healing people. Let's make it happen. It's not about them being tired. It's a small move of showing us as the readers, they're beginning to abandon him. It starts off with Judas going to betray him. But the next move is that they begin to abandon Jesus spiritually. They won't even stay up to pray with him. Eventually, it will be physically, but it starts off spiritually. And, I, and it could, honestly, now that we think about it, it could have been that they abandoned them mentally at two at some point, psychologically, when they started arguing about who was the best in the room, right? These little moves of, this is a build off of last week. Last week, they just didn't get it, so they stopped actually trying to get it. And they just started going, like, let's just make this happen our way. I think the disciples are starting to feel that now, too. The next thing that happens in the story is that Jesus is arrested. The writer of John has this really, really cool, excuse me, John, who wrote John, he has this really cool um, depiction of it where Judas comes up with all of the, the guards and all of the priests and they're like, hey, we're here to, like, we're, we're up here. Jesus like, who are you here to get? We're here to get Jesus of Nazareth. I am who, you've, who you're here for, Jesus says. And then they all fall back, right? If you've read that, it's in the Gospel of John. They all fall back. It's not like they get pushed back. They just fall back and they fall to the ground. They get back up and Jesus like, who are you here for? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he, right? And th like this happens now, th this happens for a third time in the, book, in the book of John. And then Peter starts cutting people's ear off, da, 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 right? Yes, they're all physically there at this point. 
But by the time Jesus is arrested, they don't know what to do. So they actually all start to scatter at this point. The next thing that we see is Jesus on trial. He has three different trials with three different judges. And I don't know what to do with Jesus because Jesus is not really answering their questions plainly, but they feel some kind of way about how he's not respecting their authority either. And after all these trials, the disciples are literally nowhere to be found at this point. Jesus is alone. He's in his cell alone. He's in these courtrooms alone. Pausing at that place of being alone because we might not catch this, but it's something that stood out to me while I was thinking through this because I didn't catch it before thinking through and prepping for this, like what it is to be a lamb or a sheep in a herd. And all of them are together. They're all doing everything they do together. And in this story, Jesus is the bell, the you, the bell, or excuse me, the lamb that has a bell on. Everyone's follow, all of the sheep are following that sheep, that one. Do what I do. So I ring the bell and we come over here. Do what I do. And at this point, the bell sheep is about to be sacrificed and is in the holding pen alone separated from all the other ones. No wonder they scattered. <laughs> the one they've been following is about to go be sacrificed and they have no idea what to do. What are we supposed to be doing right now? Jesus was actually showing them, it would be good for you to pray, but y'all taking a nap. Jesus is alone in all of this. Long story short, it's decided that Jesus is going to be crucified. There's lots of details. Listen to them, you know, with the version Bible app or, um, or read them. The next thing we see is Jesus carrying the cross. That's the next part of the story. This is Friday in the story. When we get together for that open house this Friday, everything that we've just talked about is in the rear view, and this is what Friday begins to look like. This savior, this Messiah, this healer, this prophet, this teacher, carrying the apparatus he will be killed on. The next part of the scripture is Jesus is actually crucified. And there's so many wonderful little nuances in the gospels, but that's what's happening there. Jesus dies. I think my favorite little nuance in one of the Gospels is that they're belittling Jesus, they're mocking him, and he's up there. And at some point, Jesus is, when, after Jesus dies, the earth shakes, and one of the Roman guards says, whoa, surely this was the Son of God, which is like, ooh. That just like, that's one of those things that gets to my core. Like, it's not because they've not experienced earthquakes before. They've experienced earthquakes. But there was something about what was happening in that moment that the creator of the universe 
not just shaking the earth, but all of what was going on spoke to the soul of this man who didn't even have a relationship with. It's one of my favorite things about the, when we are able to actually hear and speak and live the gospel for what it really is. Not the, not the tropes and not some of the, the cotton candy version that we talk about. And even when we talk about giving our life to Christ, sometimes we are really trying to invite people to avoid something rather than to experience intimacy with God. Avoid suffering and be with God. And that's not the gospel. <laughs> But when we actually get to a place where we, are, we can see the gospel, we can see Christ and the story of his sacrificial death for me, even those of us who are not yet in relationship are moved by that. The last thing before the resurrection is Jesus was buried. He was a tomb owned by a man named Joseph. He donates it to Jesus' burial. And Jesus is laid to rest there. There's not any special little notes for this one. I actually wanted you to consider the story. And I know that sometimes we want to walk away with something practical but if we're going to actually carry a tradition of like of Passover in the way that it was, there was no special applicable note. It was remember what God did for you. <laughs> That's the note. Remember what God did for you. The freedom that you have is because God did something. The whole reason we have this meal, the whole reason we showed up to this city together is because God broke through time and space and did something on your behalf. <laughs> Remember that. The thing that I think I want us to remember is Jesus was the Passover lamb. Jesus, not like... The picture that we got to see on the Prince of Egypt was just a trailer for what the real Passover lamb would be. This is the Passover lamb. This is the lamb that died so that we could actually have blood to cover something with. Why does that matter? Because your honor is actually maintained if your, blood, if your house has the blood of this lamb on it. Your life is maintained. Your livelihood is maintained. One of my, the most gripping parts of that scene is after the lights go and it's such a beautiful thing and everything and the, the, like the, that spiral in the sky goes and it returns to the stars, this agonizing cry coming up from the city. My life is not that because the blood of this lamb. Amen. I have hardship, but my life is not a long agonizing cry until my death because of this lamb. And I know that we've talked about Christ as a lamb before, but I need us to see that the lamb is not, it is specifically pointing to this idea that there was something that needed to die. This lamb needed to die so I could be covered. My house could be covered. Is your house covered is the question. And that's not a like, be afraid if your house is not covered. I'm just asking because when Moses was telling the children of Israel, like, hey, we need to make sure we cover these houses, walking through, the, I need us to see walking through the city, hey, sis, is your house covered? <laughs> Bro, is your house covered? I'm asking you, is your house covered by this blood of this lamb? Yeah. 
Because that's what I actually want you to, that's the only thing I want you to remember. It's the only thing I want you to think about this week. That's just the only reason Holy Week even matters. It's this covering. It's this sacrifice. It's what we'll get together with and remember on Friday that there is a God who has loved me enough who has wanted to see me free from the bondage and the slavery of sin and give me life that is not one long agonizing cry, but peace, anticipation, waking up the next morning, seeing your firstborn, and you all getting up and leaving Egypt kind of anticipation. This is this lamb. Jesus is that. And Jesus has done the exact same thing for me. Jesus has done the exact same thing for us. Are you covered? And if you are, remember it. Think about it. Wake up tomorrow morning. Thank you, God. See the lamb's blood over your door. Thank you, God. That there is a dying world around me and you have passed over my house. Thank you, God, that it feels like the country that I live in might be spiraling, but you've passed over my house. It's going on in this treasure, my house. Thank you, God. Wake up Tuesday with the same thought in mind. By the time you get to Wednesday... I'd like you to actually be thinking about that sin struggle that you had before Jesus passed over. Some of us that might have been various addictions, but this Passover lamb has made me not lose my life because of something that had me in bondage. Thank you that you freed me, Jesus. Some of us were struggling with Doubt and shame to the point that it crippled us to the point we couldn't get out of bed sometimes. But this Passover lamb has not let that be the end of my story and I can get up with joy. Thank you, God. By the time you get to the middle of the week, I need it to go beyond just the surface. And it to be that this God freed me from something that would have crippled me. But because of this blood of this lamb, Thursday, staying in that place. And Friday, remembering, watch, look, pick up a picture in your mind of the lamb of God carrying the cross that he is about to be killed on so that you could actually have the life of freedom that you do have and remember it. (laughs) Remember it. There's no special note. There's no special application. This whole week is about remembering. It's a tradition that goes back as far as the first Passover. They remember I want us to remember. Some of you are like, I don't have that yet. Yet. This God, this lamb did not die for a few of us. (laughs) This lamb died for all of us. This lamb was sacrificed so all of us could have freedom. You too can have freedom. You too can have joy. It's not something that's oh, just the ones that, be, that were raised in church or just the ones who have these kinds of gifts or just the ones who really, really know the Bible. Nope. All of us. You got breath in your lungs. This lamb died for you. This lamb has blood covering your life too if you want that blood covering your life. So the invitation is, do you want that? Do you want that? I don't know what that looks like. It's okay. 
the Israelites didn't know what it looked like either, but they trusted that if they put blood on their door, they would have life the next morning. You may not know what tomorrow looks like, but are you willing to say that I'm, I will trust that lamb for the life I will have tomorrow? So just where you are, if you're in a place where you're saying, I know that I need that, just where you are, you can, you don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to do anything with your body. But you could whisper a quick prayer, God, I know I need that. My life feels tight. I know I need freedom. I can't even imagine what it looks like to have my mind not racing all the time, but I know I need your peace. I receive your gift of this sacrifice so I can have it. Literally, that's it. I know that feels like we've heard that over and over again, but faith, when we take steps in faith, it really is just that. Wake up tomorrow saying it too. And the next day saying it as well. Then you too can remember that there was a sacrifice made so that you can have life and that it would be full life. I know that um, I said you don't have to do anything with your body, but if you're a person for whom this is the first time you've ever thought about or done anything like that, prayed anything like that, in those black boxes, there's some envelopes. Just use that as a scrap piece of paper. Say, I've prayed a prayer like that for the first time today. Put your first name on it so that we can be praying with you. That's kind of it. Ultimately, as another sheep in this, in this fold, I want you to live in freedom the way that Christ came to be a Passover lamb for you to have. We pray for you all, we pray for us rather. God, thank you that you have, you gave us the first Passover that came from you. And then, Lord, you upgraded that Passover with Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, God. You care that much for humanity that even when we don't get it, even when we abandon you, even when we betray you, even when we deny knowing you, you still cover us. You still want freedom for us. You still desire good for us. You still want to see us living full life. It is your mercy and that kind of kindness that makes me want more of you, God makes us want more of you, that makes us want to follow you more. So for all of us, give us grace this week to remember tomorrow morning with this picture of you in our mind of how you have freed us, this blood over our own door, our own life, being covered in your blood, God. Your life. Give us this picture by the middle of the week may that be deeply echoing and resounding in us that you have made a way for us to have life in the middle and surrounded by death 
And as we get to Friday, may our gratitude run so deep. May our awareness of our need for you be so evident that we are moved to worship. God, for those of us who are new on this journey of faith or maybe even starting it today, will you be with us in a way that makes it really clear and apparent that we are recipients of this peace and of this joy. Bless your church, not just us here, your church worldwide. As many of us begin this journey of remembering, God, may your church see this week as a Passover meal in which we remember what you have done for us. And when we get back together on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday, may our praise be so robust that another earthquake happens, but not one that hurts stuff. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>